I have no political sympathies for Britain First, who are a far-right party in Britain who are being persecuted by the government. And if you were to call them a nationalist and a socialist party, you would have an accurate description of their policies. Britain First rose to prominence in 2014 when the mainstream started noticing that they had half a million likes on their Facebook page and that their propaganda was being shared far and wide. Needless to say, this made a lot of people very uncomfortable. As you can see from this article on Open Democracy UK, they are described as a child of the British National Party in the English Defence League. Britain First has shifted the glare of bigots from race war to faith war, which is a losing hand in Britain, which is majority irreligious. Meet the man behind the fastest growing far right movement in Britain and find out what makes him tick. I haven't done a huge amount of background reading into Britain First, but apparently they were a former Calvinist minister's true baby. So Britain First's real leader is Jim Dowson, who is a Calvinist minister and who had been part of the British National Party, but apparently he was never driven by racial hatred, anti-Semitism and neo-Nazism like the BNP, he was simply driven by fundamental extremism. We've been inside and out of the Dowson Empire for nearly seven years. We traced his career through churches, courts, marching bands, tribunals, scuffles, family planning clinics, gay weddings, and paramilitaries dating back some 30 years. It would seem that Dowson's objection to the Islamification of certain areas of Britain is on religious grounds, which honestly puts him in the same league as the Muslims in the Middle East, who also do not tolerate other religions on religious grounds. Britain First really hit the international headlines though when Donald Trump retweeted three videos from Jada Franson, one of uh, Britain First leaders, which are apparently anti-Muslim videos. The videos were of Muslims doing things. One of them was smashing the Virgin Mary, one of them was chasing a group of ISIS fighters chasing a man around a roof, and I can't remember what the third one was. But only one of them was actually a false video, like falsely portraying what it claimed to portray. The other two were portraying accurately what they were supposed to show. And naturally, in response to this, the Conservative Prime Minister of Britain bowed down to Jeremy Corbyn's moralising and condemned Donald Trump's far-right retweets. Of course, Twitter followed suit and then decided to suspend the Britain First accounts, naturally. This led Britain First to signing up to Gab.ai, which is completely understandable, given how Gab.ai is a platform for free speech, which I have to say, and this might offend some people, but includes hate speech. Describing how you don't like something is part of your free speech, and if you cannot do that, then you do not have free speech. And yes, for anyone who's curious, that's the point I'm making. Britain does not have free speech. If the people who say the things we don't like to hear are not protected by the law, then we are not protected by the law. Uncontroversial speech does not need protecting. And so we come to today's news, which is Facebook also banning Britain first. And that's a great deal more significant. As the Telegraph reports, Britain first had more than 2 million likes on their Facebook page, which, again, as they say, was more than twice of that than the next political party, which was the Labour Party. They have more followers than the Labour Party and the Conservative Party combined. This is important because Britain First are speaking to issues that are resonating with large sections of the population, and if you know anything about the class system in the UK, you'll know that it's the working class population that they are resonating with. Facebook said it had sent repeated warnings to Britain First, including a final written warning which was ignored. We do not do this lightly, but they have repeatedly posted content designed to incite animosity and hatred against minority groups, which disqualifies the pages from our service. We are an open platform for all ideas and political speech goes to the heart of free expression, but political views can and should be expressed without hate. People can express robust and controversial opinions without needing to denigrate others on the basis of who they are. So it turns out that Facebook is tone policing Britain first, and as the picture accurately represents here, Jada Franson and the chap with her are indeed political prisoners, and they are currently, in fact, in jail. They have been jailed for hate crimes, as you might imagine, given the sorry state of modern Britain. So the pair were both convicted of religiously aggravated harassment by a judge. Now, this does not mean that they are racists, this means that they are showing religious intolerance. 
Judge Justin Barron told the court that the pair's words and actions demonstrated hostility towards Muslims and the Muslim faith. It's very interesting. Demonstrating hostility towards Muslims? I could understand the argument for that. But demonstrating hostility towards the Muslim faith? Any British citizen should be able to demonstrate all the hostility they want to an idea. Ideas do not have rights. The fact that a British judge thinks it is incumbent on themselves to defend a faith is particularly disturbing to me. It is not the job of the British government to protect a set of ideas or beliefs. This is skirting dangerously close to being a secular blasphemy law. Jada Franson was accused of saying that Muslims are bastards and rapists to the defendant's brother. She was also convicted of a fourth charge against her after visiting the home where Kelly was with her young kids and shouting racist abuse, but the judge said he did not hear the use of the word scumbag or hear the rattling of the door handle, but he convicted Franson on the charge of religiously aggravated harassment nonetheless. So the question is, to what are Britain First actually objecting? Why are they not banging down the doors of Sikh houses, or Hindu houses, or Chinese houses, all large ethnic minority groups in the UK. Why only Muslim houses? Well, it's obviously because there are problems coming out of Muslim communities that are affecting native British communities. Problems that these communities did not ask for and have no other way of dealing with because the police will constantly downplay just how bad this problem is. And then they will say that they are not playing down child sex abuse, even though by all of the evidence we have, and we don't just have it in this one town, it does seem that there is an epidemic of child sex abuse in Muslim communities in Britain. This is just the fact. I'm not making this up. I'm not doing the investigations. I didn't perform the Rotherham inquiry. I didn't come to these conclusions. This is just what is happening, British government. So me saying it is not incitement, unless telling the truth is now a form of incitement. Which is why Lord Pearson has to ask this question. If we accept the views of our lead police officer for child protection, of Rotherham's MP, and of the recent Jay and Quilliam reports, we seem to be looking at millions of rapes of white and Sikh girls by Muslim men, only 222 of whom have been convicted since 2005. So, my lords, will the government ask our Muslim leaders whether the perpetrators can claim that their behaviour is sanctioned in the Quran oh. and to issue a fatwa against it? And second, my lords, will the government encourage a national debate about the various interpretations of Islam? Can we talk about Islam without being accused of hate crime? Now the British government has to actually start taking theological positions on Islam. They have to effectively implement a de facto version of Sharia law in order to actually control the Muslim population of this country. I'm not happy about this. When people say Muslim communities refuse to integrate, and there are many Muslims in Britain who refuse to integrate, then we have a problem don't we? And ultimately, the liberal nature of British society cannot be the thing that bends under these circumstances. This is where we have to show some spine, show a stiff upper lip and say we're sorry if you don't like it, but this is how things are done in this country. Many Muslims believe that there is a sense among young Muslims that the Middle East is being attacked because of its Islamic identity. The growth of Islamophobia simply feeds into that assertion and creates a toxic mentality among some that the West truly does hate Islam. Even a far-left publication like The Independent can suggest that foreign policy is not actually the reason that we are experiencing terror attacks. The reality is that a portion of Muslims are simply not culturally integrated, do not see Britain as home, and resentment over foreign policy builds on their vulnerability to extremism rather than outright creating it. Being a Muslim today is as much a cultural identity as an actual religious one for young individuals like the author. It's a sign of being different within the West, and it's often an identity that comes hand in hand with discrimination and persecution. So we have one of two options. 
we force these people to culturally integrate, or we implement a version of Sharia that applies only to them. And maybe this is the answer. Maybe Muslims should be prohibited from buying alcohol. Why? Because that's their faith. They're not allowed to have alcohol. Maybe Muslims should be prohibited from fraternizing with between the genders. Why? Because Islam demands it. I assume that these rules wouldn't apply to non-Muslims, because you'd think this is a pluralistic and tolerant society. If we have to tolerate them living by their rules, then maybe the government should be imposing their rules on them, and making them live by them. Honestly, it's not my solution, but it seems to be the, one, the direction in which we're heading. I don't think we should be doing any of this. I don't think we should be kowtowing at all. I don't think we should have a single Sharia court. I don't want to do any of this at all. But it seems that there is no other option at this point than to have a second set of rules for the Muslims who refuse to become British. If the friction between the native British communities and the Muslim immigrant communities cannot be addressed by the government in a way that prevents the Muslim communities predating on the British and Sikh communities. In fact, I'm not even distinguished between British and Sikh, because to a large extent, the Sikhs are part of our cultural identity. If these cultures can't be forced to get along, if the Muslim communities cannot stop producing grooming gangs, you are going to see more, I say, grassroots activism in the loosest sense here, but you are going to see more things like punish a Muslim day. You are going to see a continued rise in hate crime as people feel that they are being victimized unjustly by Muslims in their country and the authorities are doing very little. You will see them harassing and targeting MPs who are also Muslim because they feel that they do not have a voice because whenever they voice their objections to Islam and what Muslims are doing because of Islam, and it is because of the identity of Muslim that this is happening, this will continue. This is not what I want. I'm not advocating for this in any way, shape, or form. In fact, I advocate directly against doing this. But these things are happening whether I like them or not, and whether the establishment likes them or not. But it is time to have an honest conversation about these things, instead of banning a young woman from Canada who thinks that Allah might secretly be gay. It is not enough to simply call the people who are concerned about these things fascists, even if the people who speak out against these things actually are fascists. This is a problem that millions of people in my country have. It is the job of the government to solve a problem like this. Otherwise, you get vigilantism. And I am sure, absolutely sure, that is not what any of us want to see. The concept of the hate crime must go away. So people can say what they want to say, regardless of whose feelings are hurt. And when young girls stop being raped, when young men stop being beaten, when there is not a continual problem with Muslim communities next to the non-Muslim communities, and I do not just mean white British, then this will stop happening, which is why it's not happening with Sikh communities, which is why it's not happening with Chinese communities or any other kind of immigrant community to this country. It's only happening with one. Something needs to be done, and the way that the current laws on hate speech are on the books, and probably by design, they are directly inhibiting that conversation to release the pressure that is building up in society. Because for millions of people on the bottom rungs of our society, this is becoming intolerable, and they won't continue to take it. This is again, as I say, not advocacy. I'm not in favour of Britain first. I'm not opposed to Muslims as people. I do not think they are all one way or another. I am telling you what is happening, whether you like it or not.